teeth. We spend fortunes on them. The British, about four billion pounds a year. Nothing when compared with Americans who spent $165 billion in 2022. But where did it all begin, this obsession with teeth? Well, as with the history of almost everything, you have to go here for origins, Africa. In 1858, Ottoman vassal Mohammed Said of Egypt gave this man, Auguste Mariette, the title of Director of Egyptian Antiquities. Two years later, Mariette had begun work here, the Saqqara Necropolis. But it wasn't until 1861 that Mariette would unearth something incredible from beneath the Egyptian sands. Amidst the Saqqara tomb complex, he discovered something that didn't quite fit. It was a tomb more popularly referred to as a mastaba. But why didn't this mastaba fit? It didn't fit because it didn't belong to any pharaoh or even members of a pharaoh's family as the mastabas at the Saqqara necropolis tended to be. Instead, this old kingdom tomb belonged to a mere mortal. Auguste Mariette had discovered the tomb of Hesi Ra, high official of one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs, Jossa. Pharaoh Jossa is fascinating. Some believe him to be the pharaoh in the biblical account of Joseph. What is more certain is that Jossa seems to have been the founder of the third dynasty and a period of expansion for the ancient Egyptians. Jossa was also responsible for many of Egypt's early constructions and the builder of this, the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. But even more importantly, Jossa was patron to some of the most talented men in Egypt's history. One of them was the scribe Hesi Ra, and in 1861, Mariette had stumbled upon his tomb. Mariette said this about the discovery. Quote, Hesi Ra's tomb is built of yellow bricks, and the main chamber consists of a long corridor filled with rectangular niches. It was behind those niches that we found the tables. Close quote. What tables? Mariette was writing about the wood engraved tablets bearing the face and likeness of Hesi Ra. But before you see those tablets, you need to know a few things about Mariette's discovery. The French archaeologist is said to have found five cedar wood planks intricately decorated with reliefs measuring approximately one meter in height. Mariette extracted and brought the reliefs here, the Bulak Museum in Cairo. Years later, when the Museum of Cairo in Tahir Square was built, the panels were relocated there. This is a picture from the opening of the Tahir Museum in 1902. Notice anything? No? You might do when you compare it with this picture. And this. And this. And this. See it yet? Well, let's hold on to the secret just a little longer. Watch to the end when I'll be exposing the dark secret behind these images and also when the image of Hesi Ra will be unveiled. For now, we need to find out what happened to his tomb shortly after it was discovered. Quick answer, it disappeared, literally disappeared. Nobody could find it. This is because Auguste Mariette wanted it to disappear. Various explanations are given, two of which are these. One, Mariette often reburied his finds to protect them from looters. But that doesn't make any sense, seeing as Mariette himself was, let's face it, a looter, just one that operated officially. Truth is, many of the early excavators of ancient Egyptian sites operated with impunity at a time when Europeans held a colonial hegemony over much of Africa, particularly North Africa. And it is during this period that many authentic Egyptian artifacts found their way into the hands of private collectors all over Europe and America. But another, more plausible reason as to the disappearance of Hesi Ra's tomb is that Mariette had a notorious reputation for spite. In an age of Egyptomania, he simply couldn't bear his competition getting hold of his site of discovery and making their own findings. Indeed, he was often accused by his contemporaries of vandalizing excavation sites after he had finished with them himself. And so, Hesi Ra's mastaba remained lost to the world for half a century until in 1911, archaeologist James E. Quibell painstakingly retraced Mariette's steps and rediscovered the tomb of Hesi Ra. 
This time, Quebel found more panels, not mentioned by his predecessor Mariette, but according to him, these were in such poor condition that he decided to leave them in the tomb. Something else Quebel describes seeing inside the master bar are its walls. Quote, there were no scenes of offering bearers, no images of little explanatory texts, no figures of animals or men, but a long succession of oblong frames placed on a matte surface." Close quote. Quebel also discovered a bone handle inscribed with Hesira's name, and the period in which Hesira lived was confirmed by a clay seal bearing Pharaoh Jossa's name, again found by Quebel and his team. But what exactly made Hesira so extraordinary that he was appointed a burial site with Pharaoh Jossa and his descendants? For that, you have to turn to the five wood panels found by Mariette. On these were engraved several titles held by the scribe during his lifetime. The titles are as weird as they are mysterious. Sorcerer Priest of Mehit, Elder of Kedhetep, He Who Sees the God Min, Acquaintance of the King, Overseer of the Craftsmen of the King. The names go on. For now, there's one title left out that you ought to pay attention to, the Great Ivory Cutter. This phrase can also be translated as the Great Dentist. Why the dual translation? Likely for the same reason barbers in Moorish Spain were known as Algebrista y Sangrador, Restorers and Bloodletters, or Bone Setters and Bloodletters. Algebrista coming from an Arabic word the Moors brought over, al -Jaber meaning to restore, what was being restored, bones and the human body in general, and sangrador meaning bloodletting is a reference to the many gruesome practices associated with medieval surgery, including the actual act of letting out blood from the sick in the belief that this let out impurities. But Moorish surgeons didn't stop there, they also commonly doubled up as barbers, seeing hair management as one of the body's crucial functions. In fact, this is where the red and white symbol for barbing is said to have originated from. If you went to a bone setter and blood letter in medieval North Africa, chances are for a little something extra you could also get your hair cut. But back to Hesi Ra and his title of Chief Ivory Cutter. As with the Moors, this title probably took on the double meaning of dentist due to the likely crossover of both professions. Ivory dentures might well have been used by the ancient Egyptians, the skill of carving ivory to this end being crucial, or perhaps looking at the superficial similarities between teeth and ivory, to work with teeth became synonymous among the Egyptians with carving ivory. In any event, most academics accept the translation referring to Hesira's role as an ivory cutter as indicating he was some type of a royal dentist. But why is this so important? Well, because it makes him the earliest documented dentist in all of history, a profession that was crucial to the pharaohs of Egypt since cavities and abscesses were common among the upper class. Something else crucial to members of ancient Egypt's upper class was this, Sebrus Libani, or as it's more commonly known, the Lebanese cedar, renowned in the Bible and other ancient texts for the strength and durability of its wood and its medicinal properties, it is from this tree that the five famous panels of Hesira are carved, and they are each masterpieces of craftsmanship. They show Joss's great official, possibly the father of dentistry, at different stages of his life, as a handsome young man, a man in the prime of youth, a strong middle-aged man, a slowly aging man, and finally an old man seated, dignified, at an offering table. The detail on the panels are phenomenal but it's the detail on one specific panel that more than the others reveals a dark secret about the great cutter of ivory of the ancient Egyptians. This one, showing Hesira as a healthy middle-aged man. Slung over his shoulder are the tools of an Egyptian scribe, a palette, ink bag, and brush holder. One Egyptologist explains, quote, the scribe either carried his writing utensils in his hands or if he needed his hands for other things, slung over his shoulder in such a way that the palette lay on his chest, ink bag and brush holder on his back." Close quote. But in an age when we are supposed to believe the Egyptians were a people of Levantine extraction, the depiction of Hesira on this wood panel could
could not be any further from Levante. In short, what you are looking at is an African man extraordinaire. Observe the pronounced nature of his cheeks and lips, a feature typically absent from the depictions of other Levantine and Middle Eastern peoples' antiquities. Hesira's face is characteristic of what anthropologists call prognathism, a physiognomic characteristic almost synonymous with black people groups or people of African origin. But it's not this alone that tells us of the ethnic makeup of one of Egypt's greatest men. Hesira's secret is in his hair. It's hard to deny and yet denial is what many experts do when they obfuscate and tell you that what you are looking at here is a wig. Except no wig resembling the afro-like texture you can see depicted here has ever been found in an Egyptian tomb. Ever. What you are looking at is why Herodotus called the typical Egyptian of quote black skin and woolly hair. He doesn't say that they have dark skin and woolly hair. He has they have they say have black skin and kinky hair. Using woolly hair actually is the pretends that the word that he's using is the same word that's used for sheep and it's not. Sheep's hair is not what they the word they use to describe people's hair. So we want to be careful. It's like tightly twisted, right? Or kinky hair, not woolly hair. And it's not dark skin, it's black. And this is a word that is used of Ethiopians, of Egyptians. But why should any of this surprise us? It didn't surprise the very first people to study the ancient Egyptians and unearth their tombs after thousands of years. One wrote this, quote, From what has been adduced, we may consider it as tolerably proved that the Egyptians and Ethiopians Nubians, are the same race whose abode from the earliest periods of history were the regions bordering the Nile. Close quote. Another said this, quote, the original Egyptians are inferred from the evidence of their sculptures to have been a Negro race. It was from Negroes, therefore, that the Greeks learnt their first lessons in civilization, and to the records and traditions of these Negroes did the Greek philosophers resort as a treasury of mysterious wisdom." Close quote. And Auguste Mariette himself, who first discovered Hesira's tomb, wrote this of another burial complex, this time at Thebes in Upper Egypt. Quote, the inhabitants of Thebes interred at Dra Abul Nega, the necropolis of that early period, were frequently Negroes. Close quote. Okay, so what happened to change the popular image of the Egyptians from quote Negroes to well this? The answer is Egyptology. In league with an ideology of racial purity endemic throughout Arabized Egypt, the discipline's adherents decided that opinions like the ones you've just heard were too inconvenient for the modern world, and that the view of the ancient Egyptians being kin to their African brethren further south needed to be downplayed at best and at the worst erased. It's for this same reason that when the Cairo Museum at Tahir Square opened in 1902, many of these faces, the faces of black men native to the two lands of Egypt, Lower and Upper, were not invited. You will not see the real excavators of the necropolis of Saqqara Hesira's Mastaba, the tomb of Tutankhamun, and many others in the historic photos unveiling the ancient Egyptians to the Victorians and the Georgians of the early 20th century. They, like the authentic faces of ancient Egypt, were being whitewashed away, replaced by faces convenient to a world that preferred fantasies soothing to their conscience than those that tell the story of a stolen legacy. None of that matters though because right to the very last panel from his tomb, Hesira was African. His plump lips might be gone, replaced by worn and sagging skin, but once again, look at his hair. You don't have to listen to a sophist professor tell you stories about phantom wigs. You can look at Hesira's descendants today, relegated farther and farther south into Egypt and beyond, to Nubia and Kush. They are the Afar, the Oromo, the Beja, and many more. They wear the same hair you will see on many a tomb wall. The same stubborn hair that needed these to be tamed. Afrocomb after Afrocomb uncovered from the tombs of the Egyptians again and again. By the mere stubborn existence of these Northeastern Africans, a message as old as time is reverberated. You can scream at it. You can mock it, you can cry that it hurts your feelings, but you can never ever kill the truth. And that 
is the dark truth of teeth. Darker than dark. Black even. Special thanks to our producers, Black Rampage 2, African Art Legacy and Kayode Adewale. Join them and resuscitate the history of the black world with us by becoming a channel member. You can also like, subscribe and help rep the culture at our website, link in the description below. From Kush to Compton, this has been Trill Black, no doubt.